All right, scholars, thanks for tuning in for the second part of our Biome Tour. Today we're going to pick up where we left off. So the last one that we did was temperate grasslands. And what does this word temperate mean? It means not too cold, not too hot. Straparol is also called temperate shrubland or Mediterranean areas. This is where we live in Santa Barbara. If you take a look at the map here, you'll see the little sliver of the North American continent. That is Chaparral. The only other, <clears throat> the only other place that you see this on the planet is around the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, for the most part, actually. There's some tips down here in Australia. So we have a seasonally variable temperature throughout the year, but extremely long dry summers. And we do get storms in the wintertime. There are drier hot periods than the deserts, so everything has to grow when it can, and then it shuts down pretty much and waits until a rare growth opportunity with more rain. So not a whole lot of growth in the summertime. And it's a pretty striking statement to say that this area is drier than deserts in the summertime. We virtually get no rain in the summer here. But many deserts throughout the world actually have two rainy seasons, one in the uh, wintertime and one in the um, mid to late summer. We get frequent fires around here, and that's important because if you have a very dry area, you're going to get very slow decomposition. And so all this wood from the dead um, vegetation, at some point it would be piling up and be a, become a problem. And so forest fires can come through, and they can um, uh, biodegrade that, if you will, turning into CO2, returning minerals back into the earth. And so that's actually a really important thing that we have forest fires because um, it's part of the natural cycle in this area. Many species are fire tolerant, so they have adapted to be able to survive these storms. Their roots in the ground can stay um, active and vital. And many of the plants have highly active seed dispersal techniques so that they're great R strategists. They can send out their, their seeds over a wide area to help repopulate areas that have come through and experienced fire. So here's some photos for you. This is the back country. The, um, Santa Inez Mountains. Here's some views of the front country that you might see if you're driving up 154. Wildflowers. My, um, my property here. We have a geodesic dome over here. There's a view looking down um, to Santa Barbara. 154 is coming along the pass here through the mountains. Here's our house, which um, is getting hit by a snowstorm. This is a few years ago. Happens every once in a while for us. The human impacts are habitat fragmentation because this is a great place to live, lots of land development. So not much of it is remaining intact. Let's move to tropical rainforests. So this is what we think of when we talk about the Amazon. Uh, these are areas along the equator in the um, South Pacific here, Africa. It's always warm, rainy, and sunny. These are ideal conditions for plant growth. You have tall trees, vast number of plant species who are competing mostly for sunlight because there's plenty of water. There's not much organic matter in the soil. It's mostly stored in the plants above ground. This is the key point. We think of this as being super rich, fertile soil, but actually there isn't a lot of decomposing um, organic matter here. One way you can think of it is if vegetation dies here, it's going to quickly decompose um, back into basic minerals in the soil. So you're not going to find organic matter, which is more the slimy sort of decomposing matter that you, that you find when something is decomposing, like in a compost bin. Um, so lots of vegetation above ground. This is really uh, different than temperate grasslands, where you don't have much vegetation. It's mostly just grass, but you do have a lot of organic matter, which is in the soil that's uh, decomposing um, over a longer period of time and really enriching that soil. So. Some features you should know that in the grasslands is where you have very rich soil, great for agriculture. In the tropical rainforest, um, you don't have that great of soil. Here are some pictures. Here are the canopies, as I spoke about. And uh, it's a diagram. You, don't, you do not need to know the names for these layers. But here we can see some of these different plant species reaching out for sunlight. That's the main competition here. Many exotic species, very, very high biodiversity. And this area is pretty vulnerable because it's remote, so there's not a lot of oversight. 
there can be logging going on, mining going on, ranching and farming. Not a lot of roads inland, so natives can be doing um, all these types of things. 33% remain intact, but that's probably a high estimate. And these are areas that really require a lot of protection as hotspots for biodiversity. Let's move to this, let's move to the savanna. Typical savanna scene: zebras. We find this area in Africa um, largely. So here are some savanna areas, and a little bit uh, we see this area also in South America. What are some characteristics? Lots of seasonal rain, more rain than in grasslands. Um, but what really distinguishes this from grasslands is that here it's much warmer. And um, other than that, they have a lot of similarities. You have grassland interspersed with relatively few trees. You have large grazing mammals like we do see with the, um, with the, uh, with the temperate grasslands. On this continent, we have a lot of buffalo or had a lot of buffalo. In uh, the savanna, we get other megafauna like giraffes, uh, rhinoceros, elephants. Here are some pictures. Predation in action. Human impacts. This area is largely undisturbed. Humans don't like to live here too much. Pretty warm, uh, uncomfortable, muggy. Let's move to the tropical dry forest, also known as monsoon forest. We do have a lot of humans living in these areas. If you think about what countries are known for monsoon rains, countries like India might come to mind. This continent of India is mostly considered tropical dry forest. So it's warm, but not a lot of rain. The precipitation is highly variable. You, um, you get these monsoon rains that come in every year during the monsoon season, and it's intense rain. The trees are deciduous. They're dormant during the dry season. And uh, whereas for us here in, uh, in, um, in North America, our deciduous trees lose their leaves during the winter season when it's cold. There's high biodiversity here as well. And here are some pictures. Biodiversity. And um, we have a lot of ranching and farming going on here. Humans inhabit about 45%. India being the second most largely populated country. Last one, desert. We find deserts located around the Tropic of Cancer, 23.5 degrees north of the equator, and the Tropic of Capricorn, 23.5 degrees south of the equator. Um, so like here's the outback area of Australia. The temperature can really vary. It is, um, can be very hot during day and get very cold at night. The precipitation is extremely low. Um, if you look at you know, the average um, rainfall per month, very low. So the competition here is for water, not light. And some species have adapted to being able to store water effectively. The soil is very dry, almost like a dry and spongy. It's held together by tough bacteria and molds. Here are some pictures. Difficult place to live. We have very fragile ecosystems here. Not a lot of biodiversity. Plants being succulent type of plants. Some flowering during the rain season. It can be difficult to eke out in existence. Human impacts, um, most of these areas remain intact because they are just areas without, um, a, without any potential or very little potential for agriculture unless you can do irrigation, and um, which we do in this country. Think of Las Vegas, LA for that matter. Well, LA is technically chaparral, but um, you get the point. So those are all the biomes, but there's, uh, in all those different biomes, all the different types of vegetation we find in those biomes depends on the temperature, which depends on distance from the equator, and it also depends on rainfall. Those are the two biggest factors, temperature and rainfall. But now we're going to see that altitude can also create patterns. We're not going to call these different biomes, but within a given biome, you can see uh, different types of vegetation depending on what elevation you're at or what altitude you're at. 
When you're at a higher elevation, you tend to get more of the spruce fir forest, Douglas fir, trees like that. As you move into lower elevations, you start to get smaller, and in this case, you start to get more temperate, um, deciduous kind of trees. And then we can get more grassland type of vegetation and more desert type of vegetation. When I look at this picture, I'm reminded of the time I drove up through Arizona, starting at Tucson, Arizona in the south and driving up through Phoenix and up into the Grand Canyon in northern Arizona. As we were driving north, we were getting farther from the equator uh, and that has changes of its own, but mostly we were climbing in elevation. And it was really amazing to go through these different types of ecosystems, starting in Tucson where it was complete desert. You have mostly just cacti as the vegetation. But then as you continue toward the Grand Canyon, you start going through areas where you start to see um, some deciduous trees, and then you get into your evergreens. And it was really striking, even within just um, a few hundred miles of distance.